Myeloid Network, our first meeting of the year. And it's our um, delight to thank our sponsors, UC San Diego Morris Cancer Center, AstraZeneca and Charisma Therapeutics for uh, supporting this series and our uh, organizers, um, Jennifer Guerriero, myself, Joanna Joyce, Lisa Cousins, and Dmitry Gabrilovich. And all of us are thrilled to welcome our speaker today, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Robert von der Heide. He's the director of the Abraham Cancer Center and vice dean for cancer programs for the Perlman School of Medicine and vice president for cancer programs at the University of Pennsylvania Health System in Philadelphia. He is a distinguished laboratory scientist, clinician, and cancer leader who has deciphered mechanisms of cancer immune surveillance and developed novel cancer immune therapies, including CD40 agonists that we'll hear about today. He's an expert in the use of genetic mouse models and a leading architect of immune therapy clinical trials to understand mechanisms and advanced novel therapies. Uh, he is funded by the NCI, Stand Up to Cancer, Luskarten Foundation, and the Parker Institute. He publishes in high-profile journals and is a member of the um, NCI Board of Scientific Advisors, uh, the Board of Directors for the AACR, and the NCN. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Bob von der Heide to tell us today about CD40 agonists and the impact on myeloid cells in cancer. Okay, um, good Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and this yeah, is, this um, is oh, I'm hearing my echo. Is that okay? Are we okay? It's okay now. It's okay now. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen just to make sure that that, that all happens and, um, and go into, yeah, it looks okay. Looks good. Okay. So, um, you know, this is really a, an interesting uh, network that you all put together for a national conversation um, by Zoom, taking advantage of the technology. And so <clears throat> I've, um, um, I've, I've tried to shorten the talk because Zoom attention is, is hard so that we can have an opportunity to have a conversation. So hopefully I don't show you 65 slides, but maybe half as many as that, and then we can um, uh, have a conversation and answer questions. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, CD40 agonists and, and myeloid cells. I'm going to largely talk about pancreatic cancer as our experimental system. And um, the overall view here is, is really a um, based on a collection of studies over the last 10 years that very, that very nicely has been uh, uh, reiterated and, and uh, similar findings have been found by many other investigators. So, but I'll focus on the studies we've done here at Penn that have led us to the overall concept that yes, for sure, checkpoint PDL1, CTLA4 are important, but in tumor tissue uh, and cancers like pancreatic cancer that are driven by such a powerful oncogene, KRAS, um, myeloid cells are uh, a, a major obstacle for us to achieve. Uh, cancer immunotherapy in, in a couple of uh, surprising ways. And CD40 has been a tool, uh, not only that we have our eye on for translation, but also a, a tool to pressure test the system. And, and we've learned about the role of myeloid cells by, by CD40. So that's why I think it's of interest to the myeloid network. Um, this is the cancer immunity cycle. And um, there's a number of deficits that um, are um, preventing uh, full T, T cell regression of cancers, particularly in pancreatic cancer. And, and I'm gonna talk about these various things, uh, including poor dendritic cell activation, checkpoint blockade and, and myeloid blockade. And um, probably will take a concerted uh, and uh, a combined effort to address all these checkpoints um, for success in pancreatic cancer, which as you all know, is, uh, for, has been quite dismal. Um, to, to date for patients with pancreatic cancer. And that's why we studied it. Um, you know, why aren't we having success there and what can we learn from patients with pancreatic cancer? A real breakthrough for us in terms of having an experimental system was the development of the KPC model. This was developed here at, at Penn um, by David Tuvison. And uh, we have a, a large um, uh, uh, collection of these animals. We call it the mouse hospital where we 
um, explore mechanism and, ther and potential therapeutics. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the KPC model and use it yourself, but just to say from the start um, what the K and the P and the C stand for, you can see it there. This is a genetically engineered mouse model of pancreatic cancer. It's adenocarcinoma. This is not nothing to do with the RIPTAG model of pancreatic um, neoplasia. And it expresses the, the classic driving oncogene KRAS and the tumor suppressor, each mutated in the in pancreatic tissue by way of the PDX1 promoter. And these animals go on to develop invasive pancreas cancer and metastases if, um, over time. And what's important from an immunological standpoint is that this cancer develops in these mice progressively, and it goes from normal tissue to non-invasive to invasive neoplasia, and it does so in a otherwise immunocompetent host. And some of these immunohistochemistry pictures that we published many years ago down on the left show that through this progression from non-invasion to invasion, uh, the immune system becomes more and more interested as shown by CD45 immunohistochemistry, such that by the time we find tumors and we can identify them by ultrasound shown there. Um, about 50% of the cellular material in these tumors is uh, a leukocyte. And um, when we explored that, uh, we realized that the vast majority of those leukocytes are myeloid cells, uh, staining here by F480. And in contrast, um, there are very few uh, CD3 T cells. So this is an inflamed, um, but T cell cold, tumor phenotype. And, and it actually recapitulates what we see primarily or commonly in, in humans with pancreatic cancer. So the, the language there I pulled from this paper um, a long time ago where we noted that this leukocytic infiltrate um, is prominent in this model, even around the, the lowest grade pre-invasive lesions, you know, before cancer is cancer and that tumor-associated macrophages and myeloid-derived suppressor cells and regulatory T cells dominate this early response. And, and you, you, you only occasionally see T, effector T cells. You do see it in some mice, but it, it happens late. And so already this then challenged the, um, the prevailing view of cancer immunosurveillance, the immunoediting um, uh, hypothesis, in that, um, you know, this, this notion of a, an elimination phase uh, where T cells come in and, and, and eliminate tumors and then the tumor has to um, uh, mutate and, and edit itself and then the tumor grows out. I'm sure that's true in tumors, but it doesn't seem to be true in this model of pancreas cancer because um, um, there really is no evidence for an, an, an elimination phase. And, um, and we, we worried even early on that this was because of the very prominent myeloid cell. So to, to prove this, this very lowly role of T cell surveillance in this model, we tested for therapeutic effects in a number of versions of the KPC model, uh, a role for PD-1 blockade or CTLA-4 blockade. And the bottom line is it doesn't work alone or in combination. And you can test sub-Q model, orthotopic model, the KPC model. The response rate is really, really very low. And in fact, um, uh, we were aware of that. Uh, a clinical trial was done anyway, and in fact, found that they're outside of the occasional patient with MSI high, which, which do exist 1% of the time. Um, the vast majority of patients with pancreatic cancer have no response to um, PD-1 or CTLA-4. So to formally test if T cells were involved in immunosurveillance in these mice, we, we um, uh, went to the mouse hospital and uh, followed mice that were depleted using antibodies of T cells um, at an early age or compared them to control animals. And we did serial ultrasounds. You can see one of our graduate students doing an ultrasound. And um, we tried to identify a tumor burden and survival in these mice because um, if we eliminate the hypothesis was if we eliminated T cells, then there would be a change in the natural history, just like Bob Schreiber saw in the um, in, in the sarcoma models. But we didn't see that at all. Again, consistent with the notion that this theory of immuno editing is not really happening in the KPC model. Whether we deplete CD8s or both CD4 and CD8s, there is no difference to controls. 
in overall survival, and there's no difference in time to diagnosis, and the pathology of the tumors that emerge is the same, as far as we can tell. Um, so there, there is really no role for T cell surveillance in the natural history of the KPC model. And one of the problems is, you know, we never see these T cells infiltrating, so no doubt that they weren't surveying the, the cancer. And why is that? And this slide summarizes a lot of work in many studies um, where we learned that it, it's not PD-1 and CTLA-4 it, that has activity, it, it's the myeloid cells. And that if we find a way to block the myeloid cells, then T cells actually come into the tumor microenvironment and you can see T cell mediated responses. Um, we were aware of that in, uh, um, because in working with Ben Stanger, we, I, we generated a lot of clones from these mice. And there are the occasional KPC tumor cell clones that are T cell high when reimplanted. And then it's a stable phenotype. You can reimplant and reimplant. And those are the very tumors that have very few myeloid cells. But the typical T cell low um, KPC clone um, has lots of myeloid cells. And you can see that in this, in this heat map here. If you take a T cell low clone and a T cell high tumor clone and mix them, then you get a T cell low phenotype. And it suggested that there's something dominant from the T cell low. And we, we hypothesized that it was a factor being released by the tumor cell itself, that these tumor intrinsic factors are impacting um, myeloid, um, the myeloid compartment. And in fact, we found that to be true again and again and again. And I'm just showing you a couple examples. Uh, almost, let's say more than 10 years ago, we published along with Daphne Barsaghi about the role of GMCSF impacting um, myeloid derived suppressor cells. And if you get rid of GMCSF, the MDSCs go away and the T cells come in and reject the pancreas tumor. More recently, we, we've published on CXCL1. You can see that here in the blue and green, um, that for a controlled tumor, there are lots of myeloid cells and hardly any T cells, just what I've been telling you. But if you knock out CXCL1 expression in the tumor cells, then the myeloid cells go away and the T cells come in and, and you can see tumor rejection. And you can read about that in one of these citations here. And, and very recently, we showed the same thing with the axis FA2 and COX2. You can see some examples there. So what does that look like? It, it, it's like this. The, the tumor cell is, is um, secreting all these various factors that bring in, attract myeloid cells, mature the myeloid cells, and they block T cells, making immunotherapy um, not functional. And so what we're seeing again and again is if you get rid of these factors, um, perhaps by blocking those factors or by blocking the pathway in the tumor cell that, that, that drives those factors to be secreted, myeloid cells go away. Um, and, and really, it's the immunosuppressive myeloid cells that go away, and T cells come pouring in, and immunotherapy can work. And the opportunity with these T cells is that they're now facing a tumor cell that, in fact, has never edited itself. There's never been Darwinian pressures for that tumor cell to escape. So suddenly, T cells can come in, and, and, and there's an opportunity for the T cell to reject a tumor that has not otherwise yet edited itself. Okay, so. So how do you get those T cells? So another problem we found in the KPC mice is that the CDC1 compartment is um, defective in a lot of ways. And we were able to, by flow cytometry, look at CDC1s, and you can see that the tumor microenvironment contains very few of these um, cells. Whereas um, you do see them in healthy pancreas and even at the non-invasive stage, the PANIN stage. But if you look, um, if you look um, uh, in other compartments, such as the peripancreatic lymph nodes, you can see that already at the pre-invasive stage, there are very few CDCs, inguinal lymph node, and systemically, they're not there. Um, so there's, it's early, it's progressive, it's systemic, and um, you can see by these activation markers that, that they are um, uh, inferior den dendritic cells. Um, functionally, there are, we also have evidence that they're inferior. So on the experiment on the left, we take KPC animals um, or, or controls, and we vaccinate them with a, num a, number of, a number of approaches you can see here. In this case, we're tracking an OVA-based vaccine. Healthy animals respond great, but already by pan-and-bearing KPC mice, 
um, there's a deficiency and tumor bearing mice have a gross deficiency in responding to this simple vaccine. And it's just about as bad as bad F3 knockout mice, which don't have um, cross presenting dendritic cells. You can see the positive control and the ne negative control here. So what can we do about that? Um, we then turn to CD40, which is expressed by dendritic cells and is a licensing pathway and using agonistic antibodies we wanted to see, can we rescue this dendritic cell phenotype and get function restored? And that's in fact what we observe. Um, here again is the same result I just showed you, healthy mice, tumor bearing mice. But if you use CD40 agonists experimentally in these KPC animals, you can get a T cell response back to those vaccines. That T cell response is then lost again in, in CD40 knockout mice. And of course it's lost in bad F3 knockout mice. So, so that's pretty cool about CD40. So, um, uh, we checked what anti-CD40 would accomplish in KPC mice uh, with or without chemotherapy. The clone we used is the very famous FGK45. And these are waterfall plots on KPC mice. So these are mice with spontaneous tumors. We diagnose them by ultrasound and then we treat them in the following ways you see there in colors. And then uh, 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 14 days later, we see if the tumors grew or shrank. And so here's the typical picture for progressive pancreas cancer treated with controls. The combination of chemo and CD40 um, achieved regressions, in some cases, major regressions. Gemcitabine really wasn't the active agent here. It really was anti-CD40. We published this about 10 years ago and really got us thinking about this, these regressions. These are not just slowing of growth. These are actually tumors shrinking. So we then eliminated the T cells, like I showed you, we know how to do, and we still got responses. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe this is a macrophage dependent effect. And, um, and you can see by using clodronate encapsulated liposomes, we eliminate that um, tumor regressions in the face of CD40. And we concluded that there's a macrophage T dependent, T cell independent aspect to shrinking pancreas tumors with agonistic CD40. And we know from this study that the CD40 Yes, it can activate dendritic cells, but it's also shifting the myeloid cells from a, if you will, M2 to M1 phenotype. So we were really excited about this, and I had the opportunity to present this at various national meetings and at sort of a think tank meeting in New York City. I had the opportunity to show this to the late, great Ralph Steinman, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering dendritic cells, and he listened to the whole thing very politely. And he raised his hand. He said, it's really nice work, Bob, but you're missing the T cells. And uh, I said, no, you know, did you see the T cell depletion? And, and he's like, yeah, go back and think about this again. Because if you really want success, you're going to need T cells. Um, so we did. And I um, inter uh, uh, um, started working with Kate Byrne, who now has her own lab in, at OHSU. And um, we took another look um, because Ralph said we needed to. And this is a typical picture of the KPC mouse uh, with immunohistochemistry for CD8. You can see maybe one T cell. And as I showed you, nothing happens with CTLA4. But we thought, what if we, what if we used um, CD40 and again with the chemotherapy? And here we now added nabpaclitaxel in addition to gemcitabine, which was a new, newly approved um, agent for this indication in humans at this time. And here we saw a completely different picture. So, so Ralph was right. If you just manipulate the system in the right way, you can see T cells pouring in. And then those T cells are now subjective to the immunosuppressive factors of PD-1 and CTLA-4. And if you then at the same time block those, you get major regressions and we published improved survival. And all of that is actually T cell dependent and bad F3 dependent. And, and in fact, not macrophage dependent as Kate has published. So, it's confusing, right? Because CD40 can do two different things depending on, on how it's used in combination. But we found, we, we thought this was quite quite powerful. And, um, and I wanna tell you about uh, what we've done with that to bring this to life. So it turns out there are many ways in patients to activate CD40. CD40 is a member of the cell surface TNF receptor superfamily. It's expressed by lots of cells and um, and, um, it, and, it, and it's expressed by myeloid cells, it's expressed by dendritic cells, it's expressed by B cells. 
And there are a number of pharmacological maneuvers where you can activate that pathway, which is ordinarily activated by CD40 ligand on T cells. But here, this is a pharmacological approach. We've always focused on agonistic antibodies, but there's any number of ways to do it. Um, you can read about them, some gene therapeutic approaches and other things that are, that are coming along. Um, in my view, none is, none is better than the others yet. Um, and, um, uh, but it's difficult in the, in the clinical trials because agonists are hard, dose and schedule is very difficult. Um, there's a lot of controversy about the route of administration and which isotype to use if it's an antibody. And, and one of the big problems is there's so much CD40 in the rest of the body that if you give a dose of an antibody, there's a huge sink so that if you're trying to reach a dendritic cell buried in a tissue somewhere, it, it may all get soaked up before it gets there. So a lot of pharmacological challenges, but we did find a, a few reagents that were promising. One was called selicrelumab, which was originally made by Pfizer and then developed by Genentech for a while. And I'll just take you through a couple of clinical studies, um, the first using selicrelumab. So having studied this compound um, in, in patients with metastatic pancreas cancer, we turned uh, with help from Stand Up to Cancer, Lust Garden, PANCAN and the NCI to do this phase one study where we treated patients prior, these are resectable patients, prior to their surgery. Um, so the way this worked in ARM1 is they got a dose of anti-CD40, selucralumab, um, prior to their surgery. And then they went to surgery and when they recovered, they got adjuvant therapy with um, GEM, NAP, paclitaxel and Selly. And Selly. Or up front, they got chemo, CD40. Um, and um, we've published on these clinical results. Um, you know, it's provocative data. There were some long-term survivors. It was a safe approach. Um, it's really not the focus of today, but those data are available. And we began to look, you know, what we saw in the mice, did we see it in, in uh, humans? And one thing our pathologist noted is that on the resection samples for patients who received CD40, there was a, a lessening of the, of the tumor fibrosis classically seen in pancreas cancer. And that was interesting because I didn't mention it yet, but we had seen that same thing when we treated mice with CD40, um, KPC mice, that the blue uh, collagen um, disappears and, and that's felt to be on the basis of, um, of a mac one of the macrophage effects that, that, were, that were activating. And maybe that's one of the mechanisms of action. So, so we do see evidence in this trial of macrophage activation and this stromal involution. But we paid a lot of attention to Ralph's question um, of, of whether or not there are T cells. And to do this, we partnered with Lisa Cousins, who I know is an organizer of this, uh, co-organizer of this event. So thank you to Lisa um, and, and her team, where a multiplex immunohistochemical approach was taken. Um, and there's now an atlas, which um, uh, the team has published of pancreas cancer, uh, hundreds of samples where, where we now know based on this assay, what does pancreas cancer resected look like? And um, there's a, a lovely panel that you can see written there. And then using, um, taking advantage of the fact that we're looking at this whole tumor resected and not just little biopsies done before surgery, but the actual, you can look geographically in a much broader way and understand with the pathologist, where are the cells in the various locations, intratumoral, border distal, et cetera. And you can put all that data together um, and um, do some really uh, fascinating analyses. So in terms of um, cellular infiltrate from the ATLAS, you can see that there's 104 patients who were treatment naive on the, on the far left the, right here. And you can see the various infiltration of, um, for example, T cells in the red and blue and very little for most patients and no matter where you are in the tissue. There's a few patients here who received chemotherapy or chemo radiation prior to surgery and that doesn't really change the picture as far as we can tell. So these samples are now from the trial I just told you about. That's the NCI name of the trial. And um, here's the CD40 only and here's CD40 chemo. And now you, you can definitely see a difference. And these are all statistically significant as we published. And one of the big things that changes is uh, CD4 and CD8 infiltration. There's also a change in the dendritic cell infiltration and the maturation of those dendritic cells. And, and all that is um, 
uh, predicted from the effects, as I've been mentioning, of anti-CD40. And you can see, though, that there is, um, you know, the least effect is on the intratumoral space, shown here. Um, whereas other parts of the tumor microenvironment, that you see this effect more. Um, we know from this pathway, uh, Lisa knows from this, from this um, uh, assay, that there are uh, essentially three types of um, pancreas cancers. There's granulocytic rich, there are T cell rich tumors, which is a little bit different than the KPC mice where there, those types of tumors are very rare, but in humans there are some, or there are myeloid um, rich, and you can see how they've been identified. And, um, and so this is not based on gene expression, this is based on immunohistochemistry. And, um, and here are um, um, the, the heat maps showing which, which subsets are driving the, the classification of these phenotypes. And so what we've done here is superimposed our samples onto the atlas, and our samples from this study are the ones here in um, black and, and blue. Right here, these ones here. And you can see that in our post-treatment samples, nearly all of them are, are now T-cell rich. This is work that Kate ran. So in the untreated, in the atlas, um, about 37%, uh, 38 out of 104 are T-cell rich. Um, 23% in the, in the uh, chemo, chemo rads atlas, but in the experimental group here that got CD40, 82%, 9 out of 11 are now, um, now have become T cell rich tumors, and only one cellicrolyamide treated tumor remained myeloid uh, rich. So you can see now if you focus on the intratumoral compartment and just look at the T cells, and more data about this will be forthcoming. Um, um, you can see that um, there was evidence for T cell activation in both the CD4 and CD8 compartments. So it's not just that the cells are there, but they're, for example, appear more effector like with, um, for example, granzyme expression, um, only with the addition of CD40. So based on that, we then continue the translational pipeline to see if we can bring this concept forward to um, patients uh, with. Um, a large cohort of patients with metastatic pancreas cancer. And for this, we partnered with the Parker Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy, which actually sponsored this study. And uh, the phase one portion was reported in Lancet Oncology um, by Mark O'Hara and, and the team and all the other investigators at, at seven other sites as part of the Parker Institute. And in this study, these were newly diagnosed patients with first line metastatic pancreas cancer. And they all received gem nap paclitaxel, which is a standard of care. And um, they all received an anti-CD40 antibody. In this case, we're using um, APX005M, which is also called so sodigalumab or Sotiga. So Sotiga um, is an agonistic CD40 antibody with some engineering features that we liked um, and utilized. We had already completed a phase one study. We, we knew that the dose was somewhere here, so we explored two different dose levels. And then in half the patients also, half the patients also received nivolumab anti-PD-1. And um, this is the waterfall plot. This is now human beings, not mice. And you can see um, we were quite encouraged. Major regressions um, across all cohorts with only a few patients not, not responding. Um, and this is a so-called spider plot looking over time, individual patients in various uh, cohorts, and you can see um, extended um, tumor regressions over the course of um, more than a, a year. So this, uh, and, and it was safe. Um, and we were able to pick um, this top dose as the recommended phase two dose, and we took this forward now into phase two. So this is just continuing the path from initial mouse observations. Now we're into a randomized phase two study, all in the in the course of a, of a, of a 10-year period that I'm taking you through in a half hour. This is the phase two study. Now there are three arms. In each arm, every patient got gem nap, nap, gem nap paclitaxel. Again, same type of patient, first line metastatic. And in the arm A, they also got nivolumab. In arm B, they got Sotiga at the dose I just mentioned. And in arm C, they got both Sotiga and Nevo. And we enrolled 105 patients, again, randomized across the Parker Institute, seven sites, and the primary endpoint was one-year overall survival. And we compared that to the benchmark 
historical survival, um, recognizing all the caveats there, which is um, known to be 35%. But importantly, as I go into, we collected a lot of bio samples along the way and um, of both blood and tumor and stool. And these were brought to a translational suite that the Parker Institute organized and all these assays were performed and the data from those translational assays along with the clinical data were deposited into a database and machine learning was accomplished to identify potential biosignatures of benefit and we did that per arm not across arms and this was published uh, last summer in nature medicine so this is the clinical results you can again see um, a deep and major regressions in all arms um, as color coded there the one-year overall survival is shown here and you can see that um, we were surprised a bit to find that the Nevo chemo arm is where we met statistical significance, extending uh, significantly one year overall survival compared to the benchmark. Sotiga chemo um, almost made statistical significant, one more patient and it would have. Um, but the combo arm, the arm that was best in the mice, is actually the worst here and no better than chemotherapy alone. We can talk about why that was. Um, I want to draw your attention to the biomarkers, and we looked in both blood and tumor, and what we found is that there were biomarkers that, within arms, predicted um, a one-year overall survival. So, for example, high, and this was all what emerged from the machine learning. These are hypothesis generating. There's no control for multiple comparisons. Uh, this would all have to be prospectively defined, but this is what emerged and with some robust statistical uh, power. For example, high frequencies of follicular helper T cells in the blood at baseline predicted those patients who responded to Nevo chemo versus those who, who, who didn't survive long. And I'll show you that. Um, there was other, other um, phenotypes around effector memory T cells. But what's interesting is that, like, for example, those two biomarkers actually play, um, do not predict what happens if a patient gets Sotiga chemo. There were other biomarkers that predicted survival in those patients. For example, high frequencies of plasma blasts or um, um, activated non-naive CD4 cells, you can see here. These, these are biomarkers that were effective, whereas they, they didn't predict patients in, in NEVO. We, we did look at tumor signatures that was much more difficult we can talk about why but we did reveal that lower expression of tnf alpha signaling um, would predict survival in nevo chemo whereas lower expression of e2f targets and cmic um, related things was was um, uh, related to cd40 chemo and we had actually found that in the, in the mouse so we weren't surprised on that one this is just an example this is the nevo chemo arm and you can see, here's how we did it. Here's how here's the cells we're talking about here, uh, T follicular helper cells. And you can see that um, probably this Kaplan-Meier curve right here is best seen, where in green, those are patients who have a above median frequency of those cells, whereas purple are those patients had less at baseline, when we meet them. And, um, but, but the prevalence of those cells makes no, um, has no predictive value for um, patients if they got Sotiga chemo, only Nevo chemo, and certainly not the, the full combination. And then here's an example just the other way around. Uh, these are circulating PD-1 positive, TBET positive, non-naive CD4 cells. And you can see that the prevalence of those, if you're above the median, makes a difference only if you get Sotiga chemo, but not if you get Nevo chemo. And um, telling us that there's something about the immune set point when we meet a patient that could drive precision oncology of which chemoimmunotherapy they should receive. And that, that is actually the major hypothesis that circulating immune signatures predict survival in patients after chemoimmunotherapy. And it's distinct per arm. Um, what didn't we find? We, we didn't find tumor signatures to be so helpful. Um, T cell content was not so helpful in the tumor. The state of the macrophage actually was not so helpful. And, um, and there's a lot of head scratching going on here. But it did inspire us to do now a prospective study, which I won't take you through. But it, basically the concept, and this is now something um, CRI 
is helping us uh, advance is, you know, we meet a patient and we use these immune biomarkers and then assign them the right um, chemoimmunotherapy based on that biomarker. Um, and then um, if we do that and it's, and it's true, then we should be able to see a much higher survival rate if we precisely and appropriately assign the right pancreas patient to the right chemoimmunotherapy. Um, in other words, there are subsets of patients who respond to different things. Um, so I, like I uh, advertised, I, I wanted to uh, keep the, the preamble relatively short, um, but this is what I tried to emphasize, that myeloid cells dominate the tumor microenvironment in pancreatic cancer as they do in many other, particularly mucinous um, uh, tumor microenvironments. And uh, in our view, again and again, we see that this seems to be the most dominant checkpoint, quote unquote. Um, that in in many cases the myeloid cell infiltration is is um, driven by tumor intrinsic factors. I mentioned a few, and that this happens early, and that this is really one of the earliest events um, in pancreas uh, and carcinogenesis. Um, you know, we've we've looked at very early lesions, and you can see a single malignant cell holding hands with a macrophage. Um, therapeutically, this gives us opportunities. Uh, CD40 can activate myeloid cells in a number of ways. Um, it macrophages, dendritic cells, you name it. And so you can, depending on how you do the experiment, you can see macrophage dependent, you can see T cell dependent mechanisms um, that have um, um, many potential ways that we can shrink tumors. You can get T cell regression, you can get stromal involution. You can get stromal involution that allows for better delivery of chemotherapy um, and so forth. And once you, once you generate T cells, you can now sensitize pancreas tumor cells to the effects of immunotherapy by, um, by doing this. And, um, and you can actually achieve that by blocking the tumor intrinsic factor. Um, you can block GMCSF production. And as I said, that leads to this myeloid cell depletion, T cell infiltration, and now you actually begin to see um, sensitivity to checkpoint blockade. And you, you turn those tumors from T cell cold to T cell hot. Um, a story perhaps for another day, or if you want to talk about it, I didn't show the data, but we recently published that, um, or just a collection of publications have shown that mutant KRAS is which is the instigating oncogene in this model, and of course expressed by 95% of patients with pancreas cancer. It, it, in addition to all the other nasty stuff that KRAS does to drive tumors, it also drives tumor intrinsic myeloid chemokine elaboration. And we've long predicted and wanted a, a KRAS, mutant KRAS inhibitor. They are now available. We checked those in KPC mice and they have massive anti-tumor effects, um, some of the strongest we've ever seen. Um, um, but if we compare T-cell depleted mice to T-cell replete mice, we see a big difference in the effects of the KRAS inhibitors. Um, so there is an immune role for KRAS inhibitors and um, certainly something to be explored as those drugs are developed further in, uh, in the clinic. Um, so I'll take this opportunity to thank um, both current and former members of my laboratory. Um, I've mentioned a few of them along the way. <clears throat> Other collaborators here at Penn and elsewhere, um, particularly the Parker team and the stand-up team and uh, funding, as you can see, see there listed. Um, wouldn't have been possible without that. So I'm going to stop sharing and see, maybe, maybe that's enough Zoom talking for <laughs> eight in the morning <laughs> and see if we just want to have a conversation. Uh, <clears throat> that was a fantastic uh, presentation of wonderful, absolutely wonderful um, example of basic science moving into the clinic and making a difference in patients and uh, 
um, really admirable work. Um, well, we'd like to invite people to um, ask their questions directly, I think. So raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Um, Judy, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Dimitri. Robert, uh, Bob, sorry, Robert, sorry. Um, Maybe I miss uh, that uh, from the paper I don't remember uh, last year. I want to bring your attention to the last part of your talk. When you analyze the clinical response association biomarkers, you kind of didn't mention what happens with neutrophils, which is one of the driving force in your mouse model and in <clears> pancreatic <throat> cancer in patients as well. So did you observe any correlates, any biomarker association, or you didn't look careful enough? It's one question. And yeah. the second, just if you, it's a simple question, but I hope you remember that. Uh, second question is uh, uh, similar to that. When you take human dendritic cells and treat them in the CD40, did you allow evaluate the cytokine production? Basically, what I'm trying to say, is it possible that activation of dendritic cells uh, through the CD40, uh, and actually not only dendritic cells, but B cells as well, can drive uh, myeloid reaction? So basically go causing the opposite effect that would, we absorb it quite a few times in different systems. So this yeah. is two questions I'd like to yeah. your point. In. Well, it's good to see you, Dimitri, in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and um, great questions. So neutrophil profiles were, were part of the, of the um, 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 database that we looked through, and none of them emerged as a significant um factor um i suspect the way we did it would be inferior to what you would want um so i think it's a good reminder to go back and and challenge that um but we we just took the took the assays and the profiles that we had and just asked you know does it emerge with an important score and if it didn't we moved on and it, it didn't emerge um so um that's a good reminder to go back and check. Along the way, we've we've looked at dendritic cells for their for their cytokine production. That the prominent one is, is IL twelve um, from the dendritic cells, and and we we you know we we knew that in all our in vitro experimental systems we see that in the mice and in the print study we see it, um, and. Um, and you know you you can see it when the patients get CD40 and you don't see it otherwise. It, mm -hmm. it didn't predict survival necessarily. O other things about dendritic cells did a soluble CD83 response at 14 days. It did. Um, that was a post treatment. That's not a baseline one. Um, what uh, what cytokine do you mean that would would actually spoil the effect? Oh, GMCSF, for instance. GMCSF. Um, um, Activated T cells produce a lot of GMCSF. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we, we know, know that. I don't know about know, this. Uh, CDC. Sure, we know the the um, the double edged sort of GMCSF. That's why we were so shocked when it emerged as a uh, early on as this MDSC factor. Um, I I don't remember in the print study what happened to GMCSF. That's another good reminder. There, there were like two billion data points. It, it's a, it was an, an amazing. Uh, uh, Believe me, now I know. Yeah. By the way, I can give you exact everyone, number. Everyone here, that database is available, so you you can ask your your own questions. Um, it's still. Um, it would go through the Parker Institute, but yeah, it, it's meant to be available. So. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> uh, Abhi Mitra has a question. Yeah, um, thank you, Yuri. Uh, it's a very nice talk. So I have a quick question regarding your PRINCE uh, clinical trial. Usually the pancreatic cancer has a low TMB, which is reported by most of the time. Yeah. And like the data shows like a mevo chemo combination shows the best response. So like, so does it mean those T cells are like in the patient study, which are the more antigenic T cells or is just more infiltration bystander effect is showing up there? Uh, that's my first question. Yeah. Um, so you're right. Human PDA has very low TMB. Usually, not not relatively speaking. The the KPC mice has a almost none. Um, <clears throat> so t 
to the extent we generate T cells that we think are tumor regr you know, regressing and that they are seeing tumor antigens, you, you might speculate that the relevant re tumor rejection antigen, certainly in the KPC mice, is, is not a neoeptope. Okay. Um, I, I know that's crazy to say in 2024, but, um, so, but we don't know either in humans or um, mice what the T cell, the, the specific T cell rejecting antigen is. We, we don't think it's KRAS. Mm. We looked, that's hard to, hard to really say for sure. So, and, yeah, so yeah. yeah. And one more question is, since the TFH is high in circulation based on the biomarker study, so does it mean like the TLS structure, because TFH one of the player in the TLS structure formation, so is any IHC studies correlated the data from peripheral versus? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in the, um, um, so to, just to back up, yeah, we found patients that have high circulating TFH cells prevalence in the circulation. And we, we don't know why, like who those patients are and why that mm -hmm. exists. Um, but if they, if they do, for those patients who are in that category, they responded well to chemo, nevo. Does it relate to what, if we looked at the tissue for TLS structures, mm -hmm. that's a great suggestion. I, I don't know that we really checked that. In the PRINCE study, we had little biopsies, unlike the study we did with Lisa, where we had a huge microenvironment. So uh, it, um, we, we didn't include it, like whether or not there were TLSs, we didn't include it in the PRINCE database. But we could go back and look. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to, <clears throat> uh, point to a question in the chat from, or a comment in the chat from Jeff Rosen. Jeff, do you want to make your sure, comment? Sure, um, great talk. Um, so in our preclinical uh, TMVC models, when we treat them with a anti-CSF1 antibody and uh, a low dose cyclophosphate and then FEPD1, we uh, have seen permanent effects where we see TLSs that have both B cell and T cell interactions. And we did spatial uh, studies <clears> with those. And show show that there was a CD40 CD40 ligand potential interaction going on between the B cells. So, what's the role of B cells in this in this uh, uh, model that you're looking at with the KPC model? And and do you think that's important? Yeah. Um, so, the closest thing we did to really understanding that is we we repeated all our experiments in neom T mice, and we did not lose the phenotype at all. Um, we have, we, you, do see, uh, reg, uh, you do see B cells in the tumor microenvironment in the KPC model. They are some version of a regulatory B cell. Um, and it is true that if you activate, if B cells will be, any type of B cell will be activated by CD40. So you could imagine that we're converting regulatory B cells to some, some other type of B cell, less immunosuppressive. But we, we were never able to get functional data that they mattered in the T cell phenotype. Yeah, so there's also very close proximity based on IMC that we could see the interaction as well. Um, in, in the in only in the TLSs where we have this long term yeah. response. Yeah, it's um so Kate Kate has really lovely paper and uh, data in one of those papers where she looked at, in the mice for the generation of TLSs and it's quite it's quite striking if the mice gets anti C D forty. Um, and, um, you know, um, it, so it exists. So what we're, what we, I don't think we know quite yet that the TLSs are the cause of the regression or they reflect right, the fact sure. that one has now organized such a complex immune response that the immune system's doing what it does. And it's trying, it's trying to form germinal centers and a, and a lymph node in ectopic tissue. So it definitely happens in the KPC mice, but when we eliminate B cells, we still we still can regress tumors pretty strong. Okay. I mean, exactly the same. So, and uh, we recently heard your colleague Greg Beatty give a wonderful talk on liver mets, <laughs> yeah. where he he uh, added a pattern recognition uh, uh, agonist to the C CD40 and got rather remarkable effects on on the liver mets. And I was just wondering what the status of that is in terms of. Uh, oh, he's in he's in clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, he'll, yeah, it's, 
I'll let him tell you. But okay, I mean, it looked pretty. That, that pretty looked pretty exciting, and and it yeah. did not require checkpoint molecules at all. Nope. I mean, nope. Great. Okay. Um, Tyler Miller is waiting patiently. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the talk. As a early physician scientist, it's like an amazing arc from bench to bedside and back. That's very cool. Um, so my, my question is about sort of different types of myeloid cells or different myeloid programs. So you talk about the dendritic cells a lot, but, but all, most of the myeloid cells in that environment are macrophages, I assume. Um, and so are there it, either in the mouse or in the human data, did you guys break down sort of the macrophage population and find any specific gene signature that that was related to survival or response to CD40 agonist um, or T cell infiltration um, in the KBC model? Yeah, um, we did. Um, I didn't talk about it today. Um, in that Nature Medicine paper, we we put everything that hits significance in that paper and and like i can't remember them all hates type and they're they're in there but you, if you're interested you can you can find out gregory we just talked about gregory Beatty when he and i were working on that that paper i mentioned we we looked at what did cd40 do to the myeloid cells now that was 10 years ago so we didn't have a lot of the technologies and and i even said it today m2 to m1 but that is actually not really a if you go even a little bit deeper, that is not. You can see what we saw. Right. There were some features that we would classically call M1, but not everything happened. And not everything happened to every macrophage. So so there is a lot of important dissection to happen here to to the point of your question. And and we're just we'll have a ton ton to work yet to do there. So sure. I had a quick question. Uh, do you see any change in MHC uh, class two expression on dendritic cells with anti CD40 with CD40 agonists? Yeah, it 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 goes up. Yeah, yeah. It it um, there is a funny tweak there. Um, oh my gosh, it's like um, hang on just a second. I'm gonna I'm going to just look at this data. If you, um, um, it, it depends on, Judy, it depends on the tissue. Mm. So we saw some, some counterintuitive things in terms of MHC class two, I, I think it was the tumor tissue, but if you get into the lymph nodes, it's classic mm. that C uh, class two upregulation is, is, is seen on the myeloid cells and it's seen on the dendritic cells. Yeah, <clears throat> um, you know, with PI3 kinase gamma inhibitors, <clears throat> uh, that was that's one of the key findings. That plus IL twelve increase. So um, it seems like so, a pattern for uh, promoting an no, effect. So, so um, we've always been inspired, and now Kate is really studying that. Kate Byrne is really studying this in depth. And, you know, if that's true, then like, what is that saying about the role of CD four cells? And initially, we always depleted CD eights, and then CD fours and CD eights, and then we finally said like, that's kind of dumb. Let's deplete just CD four cells, and we found out. And publish this. I didn't really show it today. That that they are critical. Important, yeah. And but it's kind of weird because class two goes up on the myeloid cells and the dendritic cells, but it doesn't go up on the tumor cell. Yeah. Yeah. So like these are, but the CD4 cells are critically important. I mean, T cell help is important. I get it, but like we don't really understand how they're achieving it. Um, and so Kate is digging into that pretty. Oh, pretty good. Extensive. Okay. Um, Melissa Zar. Um, hi, in your talk, you mentioned some of the problems with developing CD40 uh, antagonists would, for a sync effect and correctly targeting it to the tumor. Um, I happen to know that AbbVie had a phase one trial of a bispecific antibody where CD40 was targeted to the tumor associated antigen mesothelin, yeah. uh, but that was discontinued. Do you have any insight or learnings from that? Um, you know, no. We weren't involved in that study. Um, yeah, no, I don't. It, it's um, it's getting pretty frustrating for uh, biotech and pharma to develop this pathway because um, uh, uh, it, it's really hard. Agonists are really hard, and um, 
you got it. It's particularly the biospecifics, the stoichiometry can really make a big difference. I, I, I don't really know the story there. It's, uh, so sorry, I don't. Um, PM Sondell has a question. Hi, Bob. Uh, Hi, it's Rick. Uh, I've got a question that relates to two others that were mentioned earlier, and that's both the immunogenicity and the great work by your colleague, uh, Dr. Beatty, with the beta glucan. Uh, in that model, it looks like he's seeing really terrific augmentation of activity when he's using the beta glucan together with the anti CD40. But yeah. the actual effector mechanism seems to be activated macrophages. Yeah. So I'm wondering if, in the setting of really low tumor immunogenicity, maybe some tumors in the clinical study by Padronidol, maybe they don't have enough antigens recognizable by their T cells to be able to get the effect you're looking for in some of your mouse models. And might the beta-glucan be turning on uh, an innate response that might be active in that setting? And so there may be a, a particular indication for using this additional way of activating macrophages with effectors. Yeah. Um, so um, I mentioned in my talk that that there were all these incredible studies that so many people have done on CD40. And so Paul is um, one of those investigators who really has studied this pathway. So it's it's nice to see you and hear your question. And as you summarize Gregory's um, work, I think that's exactly right. Um, we, you know, this, there are, there are many opportunities with CD40 and here we are trying to get a T cell effect in a, in a, in a tumor that may have very low antigenicity and immunogenicity. Um, but CD40 really, really, you know, there really is this myeloid effect that, that is independent of T cells that Gregory has been pursuing and it's impressive. And so that trial you mentioned, that, that's the trial I mentioned that's, that's active now. And um, um, uh, the data was just uh, accepted for publication. Maybe it's out now. So um, I turn, I encourage people to check that out. Thanks. <clears throat> We've had a few questions <clears throat> wanting you to comment on why you think CD40 agonists have not made it to approval yet and what you think about the um, staging of the various aspects, various components of the clinical trials, whether you think it's where you're applying the agonist and the chemo that makes a difference. Yeah, well, no one's more disappointed that, that uh, it's not FDA approved um, and, um, and why that, well, why that is, is that it, it doesn't reproducibly shrink tumors. <clears throat> um, and you're asking, was it the setting? So we focused on pancreas cancer with chemotherapy and, and, um, and you, know, we, 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 you know, maybe there's a subset of patients that I talked about and, and that's a way forward. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, there are other, other pursuits of this pathway in um, tumor types that are not treated with chemotherapy, such as melanoma. Uh, you know, and um, um, some of the early um, early work with the Pfizer antibody was um, that it's 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 the melanoma patients who had single agent activity. Mm. And right when we published that, the whole field was overwhelmed by CTLA4 and then by PD1. And I, I don't I don't remember any phase two study, but the response rate was twenty six percent. Uh, and it, it was it was real. I mean, I, I still talk to this one patient 15 years later. She's completely cured and had advanced melanoma with single agent CD40. And it was never pursued. I think that was a, a lot, huge lost opportunity. But now, of course, like, how would you do that in patients with melanoma? And people are people are studying it. And um, um, but I think your point of have we actually chosen the right clinical scenario for this pathway? Um, um, maybe not. <clears throat> um, well, I think all of those of us who have worked on myeloid therapies and uh, have seen the partial signs of success, but not nothing having made it to approval, um, 
They're pretty frustrated. Uh, oh, totally. <laughs> like I can tell you, I can take any, any immune system you guys work on, anyone here. If you put in anti-CD40 into the mouth, it'll get better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really frustrating. And so, um, um, you know, is, is there a difference between mice and humans? Is, is the agents that we take into humans really not, not modeling what we're studying in mice? Mm -hmm. um, um, is the pharmacodynamics insufficient so that we can't actually achieve because of side effects what we need to achieve the exposure of cd40 in humans like we can achieve in mice there's there's i think a lot of it is pharmacology mm -hmm. yeah lisa hey bob uh, Hi, lisa. lovely to see you this morning um so everything we've done in the mouse targeting the csf1 pathway sequencing is everything mm -hmm. and so if we don't preload the CSF1 R antagonist. Um, we do not see synergistic effects with chemo and or PD1, depending on the model, PD1, PD01. How much do you think that sequencing may impact CD40? Because in trials, usually these things all get thrown in at one time. Yeah. Um, schedule, I mentioned schedule and, um, um, you know, um, schedule is not so tricky for um, inhibitors, like we can put CTLA-4 in pretty much whatever we want. But if you switch the order of CD40 and chemo, you go from curing the mouse to killing the mouse. Right, sequencing matters. That was uh, that was a paper from Kate Kate Byrne actually in, in JI, um, and um, and you know, Robinson had the same paper. We we have actually followed. You notice we give. We give chemo, and then two days later, we give CD40. We, we are following what we thought we learned from, from mice. Um, but, okay, I know we're over time, but here's a mind melt for you. Okay, Gregor and I have talked a lot about this. Let's say, as Paul was saying, and now in pancreas cancer, just forget the T cells. You really want this stromal involution. You want this macrophage effect. Then why don't we give CD40, let that happen, just let the stroma you know, disintegrate, macrophages do their thing. Let that effect go away, you know, the, the pharmacodynamic effect that takes a couple of days, and maybe on day five, come in with chemotherapy. It's a whole nother way of doing it. See, and I would say, what about giving a, a, a four to five day lead in of a CSF1R antagonist, remove your macrophage that's making all the IL-10 that's gonna block the DC maturation and then give your CD40 so the DCs are ready to do yeah. what they're gonna do. Yeah, I like that. We should do that. Let's do that. <laughs> Bob, uh, thank you, I gotta go. See yeah. you, Lisa. Uh, if you have time, we have one more <clears throat> question or comment from Paul. Okay. Tondell. Well, or maybe a residual hand. Maybe it's residual. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, well, let's get other questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can read them. Um, some of them are related to what we discussed about the yeah. sequencing. We've on a lot of them. No, we don't I know why the triple hit. combination was inferior. Yeah, I think we hit most of the questions in the chat. Yeah, good. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I'd still, I have one lingering question about a comment you made about the relative roles of macrophages and dendritic cells in um, the T cell response in yeah. uh, to CD40 agonists in the KPC animal. Um, you, you suggested the macrophages were not, they were not involved in T cell recruitment. Was that it? Or um, oh, we just functionally, we know to the ex extent you can do this experiment and, mm -hmm. and Kate Kate tried it eight different ways. If you deplete um, the macrophages and then come in with our standard chemo CD40, which is a T cell maneuver, it mm -hmm. still works. It works just as well. Is it, it it's, <clears throat> but is there any additive benefit? No, it doesn't work any better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hmm. What about the theory that the uh, 
fibrosis is blocking T cell entry, would you then say that's not really involved? Um, there's a lot of fibrosis. Um, 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 what I what I've often answered when people ask me this is that for whatever reason, like if the fibrosis wasn't there, that'd be nice. Yeah. But an activated T cell and and macrophages, they can find their way through. They're 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 actually they have ways, you know. Well, <laughs> you know they can, you know that's what T cells are supposed to do. They're supposed to invade dense tissue and 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 do their job. And and so we can, if you do chemo CD40 and some other things that we've tried, radiation, other things. You can, I showed you the picture, you can park those T cells in there in the face of the same fibrosis. So, um, you know, um, whether large compounds like antibodies or complex other molecular structures can make it through fibrosis, I think that's a real, real, that that, that, that is real. But a smart maneuvering ATP consuming T cell, they get in there. So okay. I haven't, held that else is like it's not like a wall that's impenetrable we see them in there um if you have time i just have one more lingering theoretical question so okay. you know we all we bunch of us have been trying to develop myeloid targeted therapies one thing we've never done is really put them together so no. do you think there's some benefit for putting different myeloid therapies together do you think you know, we're asking yeah. mechanistic questions, but you know, in the clinic, you often throw things together to see what works. So, have you ever put C forty agonists together with CSF one R agonists? Antagonists? We have, we, we have, and and um and and it's helpful. Uh, uh, Kate published that. That was a J that was a JI paper um, mm. some time ago. That's how we. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't dramatic. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, a lot of the reagents are. Are, I think inferior to accomplish what you're really suggesting. Yeah. And it's really tricky. <laughs> it's really been tricky in humans. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Genentech combines CD40 with the CSF1 receptor Probably. antibody, and they reported that. I'd have to go back and, and double check. Yeah. But I think it's a good, you know, a lot of these pathways are redundant and they are, it's like whack-a-mole, you know, you, yeah. you, you think you're blocking one, so the more the more the better. We've tried yeah. to do that for neutrophil blockade. Of course, if you if you successfully achieve it in neutrophils, then you get a completely neutropenic mouse that is um, dies of bacteria. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's tricky. Yeah. Uh, well, we've got a lot of complimentary uh, comments in the chat. So um, yeah, great feedback. Appreciate the opportunity, and it's good to see everybody. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And it's what a wonderful talk and discussion. So thank you. Okay. So See you next time. Okay. Bye, Bob. Thanks a lot. Bye, everybody. Okay. Take care.